Uh, okay, thanks everyone for coming. There's more people than I expected to see here when I put in the abstract for this, so uh, thanks very much. My name's Campbell McNeil and I'm a, an architect at Dell. I'm responsible for the online experience and the, the whole onboarding process and the sort of back office management processes of um, the Dell Cloud Console, uh, which we use for provisioning existing cloud services. And I'm also heavily involved in what we're going to be doing for private cloud in terms of uh, what we're doing with OpenStack, how we're integrating that with enterprises, that kind of thing. Now, apologies for the slight disaster here with the sidebar. I'll just progress with it because I could fiddle with this all day. OK, so what am I going to talk about? First thing, um, how many people in the room are either somewhat involved with a service provider or planning on becoming a service provider, that kind of thing. Can I get a show of hands of people who plan to stand up service cl public cloud services? Great. Great to see you here. It's um, something that, you know, OpenStack gives you sort of some of the tools that you need for, but there's so much more you've got to go and do anyway uh, to actually become someone that can sell cloud, whether you can sell it to the, the, the credit card paying public or you can, um, you, you can go and sell it um, into an enterprise and actually have it you know, managed within an enterprise. Uh, with OpenStack, what you do, do get is you get Horizon. I consider Horizon to be a consumption UI. Horizon allows you to consume resources, but it doesn't get you to Horizon. And there's a lot of process that needs to take place to get someone to Horizon. And there's a lot of process that needs to take place after where Horizon fits in uh, to actually um, provide, you know, provide services. Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, I'll, what I'll do is um, afterwards I'll put them on slide share and tweet out the link and you can just email me or whatever. Yeah, no worries. Okay, so as I said, Horizon's a consumption portal. It allows you to create your VMs, your networks, that kind of thing. It allows you to manage your storage, but it doesn't get you there. You know, it leaves that OpenStack as an island. If I stand up OpenStack as it is, what happens is I've got something there, I've got separate identity services, I've got to manually put people on there, that kind of thing. Uh, that's no use, and especially as a service provider, you know, I can't sell OpenStack by you know, having someone send me an email and say they want me a, what an account, that kind of thing. I've got to go a lot further than that. Also, it doesn't give you anything around operations, although that's beyond the scope of this talk, but you know, there's a lot of sessions here on operational management, and that's obviously a key consideration for any service provider, both that both a public cloud service provider and internal IT service provider. <coughs> okay, in order to set the scene for what you need to do in terms of implementing these services, we at Dell, we use this um, uh, thing called a reference architecture. I flagged up the, the NIST and this reference architecture for cloud computing. Uh, once again, there's links to all this stuff at the end, you know, if people are really wanting to read up on this stuff. The purpose of the reference architecture is to give you a set of boxes, a set of you know, what you need to do to become something. You know, so if you want to stand up a service, you can use the reference architecture to say, these are the suite of services I need to build up my composite public cloud service. And just a bit more detail there, um, around what we do as a service provider, we need to provide a set of things, you know, service management, or sometimes called business support services, BSS. And just as part of that, you know, you've got your, you've got your whole, um, Things you need to include there in customer management, contracts, inventory, you know, accounting, reports, pricing. You've got to be able to provision. Uh, you've got to be able to meter. You've got to be able to monitor. You've got to be able to manage your SLAs. You might have to pay out if you don't meet an SLA, that kind of thing. And then there's a, this, this stuff's not stuff I'm going to cover, but you know, you've got the whole, the whole notion of uh, I'm a service provider. I stand up a cloud. I've got to be able to get customers' workload onto my cloud. So you know, these are considerations you need to make in terms of actually Building up a service that people will pay money for. Yep. No, exactly. This is the, the, the scope of this is to you know explain beyond what OpenStack provides you is OpenStack start being a cloud delivery platform, you know, a service platform for delivering VMs, networks, that kind of thing. This is about the suite of services that you need beyond that to take it and make money from it. Okay, what I've done here is just provided you know, just like a very abstract level, what it might look like if I'm a service provider. I've got to provide something beyond Horizon. This is Horizon on the right hand side here. What I've got here is basically, I call it a service management portal, service management console. You can call it what you like. The whole point in the service management console is before you actually get into the consumption 
of your cloud services. You actually have the ability to manage the, the, the specifics around those services. OpenStack, Nova being, you know, compute being a, a cloud service, object storage being a cloud service. You might have SaaS applications in your cloud portfolio. We certainly have some. You might have different cloud, cloud offers based on different platforms, that kind of thing. Platform as a service, that kind of thing. At a higher level, what you want to do is basically have a management console around that and allow customers to basically see things cross cloud platform rather than a specific cloud platform. And then what that does is that gives them access, flips them over into the likes of Horizon so you can do cloud consumption. Okay, so what I've basically you know, described there is what you want to do is you have your, your whole service management stuff which I'll go into more detail in a minute on one side, then you use OpenStack from the community, you differentiate on top of that as part of your your cloud service platform and you, you stand up as a separate service but you consolidate identity between them. And at a high level architecture, these are some of the problems you've got to solve when you're a public cloud service provider and you, you, you've, got, um, you, you've got certain things that go beyond the core OpenStack platform which I've got down here. Things that you need to go and do which I'm going to go into a bit of detail on so you understand some of the problems you've got to solve as a, you know, a service provider. You got the whole sign up process. A um, couple of ways you can do that. There's obviously a process that people are probably used to when they think of cloud. It's you know you go through a process, you swipe, your, you give your credit card number, you get an account, and then you go away and do things. You get provisions, you go and do things. Another way that we do it, Dell, um, which is you know an interesting thing for service providers, is we have a, a CRM-driven process where a salesperson can go and create a prospect, basically create a lead then that lead can you know, have a quote generated against it. And then once the customer accepts that quote and basically orders that quote, the order's created, then you dovetail into a similar process that you would do at the end of a you know, credit card checkout process. So you've got that, that means of doing things as well. Service management, I've already talked about a little bit. You know, that's the whole notion of uh, going around and actually managing that service. Uh, support, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Most people know what support is, but you know, it's a key consideration that as a service provider, you've got to be able to provide support for your offer. And obviously billing, you know, I'm a service provider, I want to get paid for it. And on top of that, you know, you've got to provide services around, around what you're doing with OpenStack that not, don't necessarily form part of OpenStack core. I say identity here because there's, you have Keystone for OpenStack identity, but if you're a service provider, one, you might already have your own view of what identity is, you know, you might have a, well, for instance, Amazon has an Amazon account, a Dell, we've got a My account, it's called, that kind of thing. Uh, you might have a, a notion of an existing identity provider which is going to drive some of the stuff you do with Keystone. Uh, a rating engine, Solometer provides meters, it doesn't rate. A rating engine basically takes the meters and turns them into something tangible you can charge for. Rating is the act of taking the usage and actually putting. So the question is, what's the difference between rating and billing? Uh, rating's the act of taking the meters and turning them into something tangible. You know, like um, it, you actually put it against a price, a rate plan as it were, we call it a rate plan. So you take, you know, I've used, you know, 100 VCPURs or something at a dollar an hour, that's, a, you know, $100. And then billing is the act of actually invoicing for that and getting the money in for it. <coughs> Um, audit, audit something that we provide, it's something that's important to consider but doesn't come directly out of OpenStack. That's, you know, the notion of being able to provide a traceability across what people have done when, who did what when, uh, so you can actually audit the service. And um, provisioning is the act of when somebody orders something, actually creating that service for them. Uh, by means of that, what I mean is, uh, you know, creating their OpenStack identities, potentially create, creating a service plan in your billing engine. You've got to create a subscription in there that, you know, it's going to be reconciled against when you actually go and do your rating and then your billing. That kind of thing. These are the sort of things you do in provisioning. Okay, so more detail. <laughs> I promise more detail around these things. For each of the sort of four pillars that I've described there, there's a lot of considerations you need to make as a service provider. And this is kind of just a bit more detail around what the Nest Reference Architecture provides and what we do at Dell. So I'll just go through some of the things that we actually uh, do as each of these processes. So when you sign up to a service, you've got to have a service catalog. You know, you've got to have a feature in there which says these are all the things I can buy, you know. Typically clouds pay as you go, but you might have reserve rate plans, you might have dedicated rate plans, that kind of thing. 
Uh, so that's part of the service catalog. You've got to be able to provide that so somebody can sign up to something. You've got to set up your login. I kind of you know, touched on that when I talked about identity. Uh, yeah, it, seems, it seems simple, but the customer, you might have your own identity provider, uh, as we do, and the customer might not have an existing account with you, so you've got to set that up. Or you've got to create some sort of you know, trust relation or some sort of you know, associated account with your Facebook account or a, an open ID or that kind of thing. It might be federated identity. You've got to set that up. You've got to validate when they set up their account. You know, they're giving, you're not giving you garbage. Okay, so we've got several steps around that. Validate that the address is correct. Set up their payment. Um, at Dell, we accept both um, credit cards and purchase orders. Uh, purchase orders is, is a back-end process to reconcile with a purchase order system. But in terms of credit cards, you've got to validate that you know, your credit card, uh, first you need to check some ID on the credit card number, make sure they haven't typoed something. You've got to go away and actually validate that credit card belongs at their, their stated address. You've got to check their CV2 number, whatever it's called. Um, you've got to validate that. Basically, you've got to make sure you're not getting garbage. And in addition, you've got to carry out a fraud check. Now, you get, as a cloud service provider, you get an awful lot of people trying to use stolen credit cards. They're trying to sign up for your services. They're always trying to get some for free. You got to put a fraud prevention check in there to try and mitigate some of that. Uh, the way you can do that is when you can use fraud providers. A simple way is to you know, validate their phone number actually belongs to them. Uh, a lot of people who try and do fraud use dodgy phone numbers, i.e. phone numbers that might be with a switchboard at a company they're pretending to represent or something like that, or you know, to a track phone, that kind of thing. So the important consideration is to use some sort of, you know, some sort of mechanism there to try and make sure that, that person who's signing up for that service is actually a genuine person. They actually do own that credit card and they actually do represent whoever they say they represent. Credit check something that's important. You know, if, um, you know, if someone signs up for your cloud with a credit card that's got a $500 limit on it, you probably don't want them going away going crazy and um, uh, consuming a lot of resources. And likewise, if your, your company already has an existing business, it might be an existing company, but you're going to have a credit department who's going to basically have standard credit terms for that customer, and that's going to influence what you can actually let, allow them to use in the cloud. That's an important part of the process. And compliance check. Um, uh, most of you are probably already aware America is not very friendly with Iran and um, you know, North Korea and people like that. A compliance check will be a trade compliance check or an export compliance check, whereby you're actually making sure that um, the customer who's signing up is in, a, is in a location that you've validated and aren't trying to do something from a, an embargoed country, which if they did do something from an embargoed country, you'd leave your company open to a lot of fines. <laughs> Uh, and bad press, that kind of thing. And then there's the concept of, you know, somebody's got to sign terms and conditions, you know, we've got two means of doing that, you know. Click I approve once you've read this huge bit of legalese, and um, when we do our, our salesperson driven process, we've got um, an electronic signature mechanism we use so people can actually, you know, electronically sign for the service and agree to it and move forward. We can move forward at that point with provisioning. Okay, uh, considerations for service management. Uh, upgrades, uh, if I'm a, you know, let's just say I'm a pay-as-you-go customer, I might want to upgrade my account to a reserved account. You know, I've been using the cloud for six months now. I know what my utilization is like. I want to lock in that utilization in a, in a reserved account, so I'll pay for a certain amount of CPU hours for a fixed rate per month, that kind of thing. That's great as a service provider as well, if you can get people to lock in and reserved as well, because it allows you to capacity plan a lot better. Uh, downgrades, once again, it's just the reverse. People are, you know, looking to downgrade their subscription, they might have a certain amount reserved, they might want to go to a smaller amount reserved, that kind of thing. You've got to put a process in place for that. User management is you know, describing the ability of managing users across cloud. The reason I say across cloud is you do have user management in OpenStack at a project level, but um, if you have multiple services out there, you know, um, at Dell we certainly do, you want to be able to manage the same identity and the entitlement of that identity across multiple services. Uh, payment change represents your ability to change how you're, pay, how you're paying. Different credit card, that kind of thing. If someone wants to change their credit card, they're going to have to go through all this again. You've got to validate that you know, they haven't gone from a good credit card to a bad credit card, that kind of thing. Uh, invoicing, you know, histo historical invoices. I'll talk a little bit about invoicing here, but you've got historical invoices. People in their service management portal expect to be able to see what they've paid for when over a period of time. 
obviously that's a role-based consideration. If you're setting up an account for a big corporate customer, not every user is going to get to see the invoices. There's going to be a finance type user there. Once again, that goes beyond the roles that you typically get with Keystone. You've got that kind of role management you need to implement at your service management level. Uh, run rate. Run rate represents how much have I consumed for this billing period. So, you know, how much have you spent? Maybe up to the last midnight. We'll run a rating run every midnight. So that up until that last midnight, somebody can see where they're at. It allows you to implement cost control as a consumer. Uh, use of statistics. Uh, slightly different from run rate. What I consider use of statistics to be is, you know, what users are using what in my cloud, that kind of thing. Once again, from service management point of view, or as a consumer, if I'm the admin, I want to see who's doing what and who's using up all the resources versus maybe I expect some people to be doing something and they're not. Uh, audit, I mentioned earlier, audit's the ability to see who did what when. Uh, uh, for, you know, so if someone creates a VM, you kind of want to know who created it. If someone powers off a VM, you probably want to know who did that, you know. All this could ultimately, you know, <laughs> influence, you know, like an audit if someone actually wants to put their, their, actual, their, their actual production IT infrastructure up in the cloud. Uh, quota management, um, obviously as a service provider, I've got a quota that ties in with a credit check. I don't want someone generating any more spend than what I deem them to be credit worthy to do. But also internal to service management, you may want to manage quotas for subtenant in your cloud subscription. So if I'm, if I'm the, if I'm a, you know, a, a CIO and I'm, I've gone to public cloud for all my dev and QA, I'm going to want to set up quotas for each sub-team that are going to consume off that account. And obviously, people might get fed up with your service, so you need to automate a, a process to allow them to cancel service. You know, that would be, you know, things like finalizing their invoices, the ability to, you know, shut down their VMs, kill, kill their data after a certain period of time, you know. For instance, at Dell, we, we, we retain data for 60 days before before actually deleting it in case there's a, you know, a service restart, that kind of thing is part of the SLR, part, part of the, you know, the, the, the service agreement. From a support point of view, um, you've got to provide means that people can get help with using your cloud. Uh, it's not something that comes out of the box, unfortunately. Uh, there's quite a lot of opportunities in support um, to implement some certain things I'm considering from what we're doing. Is, you know, if I'm in a VM and I'm having a problem with it, when I create a support ticket, I want to be able to you know, snapshot all the data and all the details of what that person is doing then and there uh, so that when the support agent picks up that ticket, they can see the VM, they can maybe click on a link to get directly to the VM. You know, There's a big opportunity with support to create a very integrated experience there uh, for getting people help and making the people who give the help very efficient. Uh, and uh, beyond that, you know, you, you want to maintain a good, a good database of how-tos, that kind of thing, forums, so people can, you know, help each other. Um, you know, something you might support uh, is, you know, an image repository. Uh, as a service provider, if you're supporting an image repository, let's just say I'm, I'm supporting Windows, say, if I put a Windows image out there that I'm going to charge for, you know, what's my customer's expectation on the state of that image? You know, you've got to provide support around that. And I'm, by means of that, if I just put Windows Server 2008 R2 out there and just leave it, I can't do that. There's a big liability associated with that. Because if I leave that for six months, it's so unpatched. As soon as someone spins that image up, it's going to have problems. So, you know, you have the whole notion of support and that kind of thing. Uh, making sure that any service you do provide is evergreen, as it were. And, and we like to provide white papers and documentation around, you know, how people can do things, your best practices, how to get your LAMP stack up and running in five minutes, that kind of thing. And last but not least in, this, in, these, in these pillars, um, billing. Billing, I mentioned previously, once you've rated the data, you get an invoice for it. So you've got the whole process of either sending an email and someone an invoice, having payment come in and reconciling that payment with that invoice, if it's a purchase order, or you have um, the, the process of you know, charging someone's credit card. You've probably got to implement processes as well there where you know, if someone's credit card declines, how do you deal with that, you know, that kind of thing part of the billing process. Tax calculation is an important consideration. You know, you've got different tax regimes in different states. We do, excuse me. Um, we've got, um, you know, different tax regimes in different states. If you do business in states, you've got to charge sales tax in those states. And likewise, if you go global, you've got different tax regimes in different countries you do business. So we've had to put a system in place where you calculate tax based on where that customer is and where you do business, that kind of thing. Uh, sales compensation sounds like a weird one, but it's actually quite a big consideration. 
Um, for instance, if you've got a salesman that's sold cloud, how do you compensate that salesman once the customer uses it? Depends on what your sales compensation plan is. You typically assist them to do that, so the sales guy gets comped on what he's actually sold. And uh, a bit general ledger there, because ultimately all the money you're making and how you're making that money and where it goes to goes, goes back into your company's book somewhere, so it goes against the, the, bigger, the bigger financial reporting things, which are way beyond my pay grade. Okay, uh, so that was all about public cloud, service provider type stuff. Private cloud in the enterprise is kind of similar, but it's a wee bit cut down. But there's a couple of different considerations, or certainly considerations I make that I want to point out. It might be useful for some people. You still have your horizon there. You know, but you know, if, if you set up Horizon as it is today in a lab, you know, your lab manager is probably going to send out somebody credentials and they're just going to use that and it's kind of going to be a once again, still an island. One of the things we do um, is we want to provide a means of managing service entitlement inside an enterprise. So let's just say a company has you know, got a very strategic point of view that we want to move all of our infrastructure on the cloud. We're sick of all these teams with siloed little pieces of infrastructure, virtual infrastructure, whatever you've got. We want to invest big stuff. We want to go big and open stack. We want to build that in there and we want to basically move all of our workload onto OpenStack so we have a single management paying for that workload. Um, in a small company, it's easy to manage just with, you know, just with this. But in a large company, it becomes a bit more of an arduous process. So to do that, what we do is we provide basically a service enablement portal, um, website, whatever you want to call it, which allows people to provision services within the enterprise. Well, some could be within the enterprise, some that could be without, out with the enterprise, but ultimately, it allows people to provision stuff as far as what they're entitled to do. And so the user experience around this is I'm a dev lead, I need, I need, I'm gonna need 10 VMs for my, my, my project, for my dev. I can go on this, I can click on, I want something in the compute lab and that can provision me an entitlement in the compute lab. But there's a process behind that that needs to be considered and I'll go on to that. So on a, a similar slant with regards to the the, the sort of overall architecture is similar to what you saw before, but the semantics of what's in these pillars is different. I've not called it sign up because it's more of an onboarding process and inside the enterprise, you know, to get that user on board onto the system. Uh, from an entitlement point of view, there's certain other considerations there, bearing in mind that just because it's internal doesn't mean you're not, you know, you're not incurring spend by using those resources. Support, once again, similar. And billing slightly different, but it still needs to be there. So go into a wee bit more detail around those. You still have a service catalog, you know, uh, OpenStack Compute, that's a service. Um, Swift, that's a service. You might have other services. For instance, we have to manage entitlement around salesforce.com. You know, you pay Salesforce 500 seats and you gotta manage that entitlement. You know, it's, it's, it's a cloud service or it's an internal service, it doesn't really matter. The fact of the matter is, is someone's gotta basically ask to get it, they don't just get it. And then there's a notion of approval. Because there's a cost associated with this, you know, it's gonna get built back, charged back within the same company. And you've gotta basically go through the process of having your manager sign it off or whoever pays the bill, sign off that, that, that resource utilization. And then based on that, I'm gonna set up an entitlement. You know, if, I, if I'm a dev lead, I get 10 VMs, I'll get set up an entitlement for my 10 VMs. And you gotta record the cost center, you know, my department, whoever, whoever I work for, who's gonna pay the bill, I gotta record that cost center. Inside the, you know, in, in, the, in the process of managing entitlement, slightly different um, from what we've seen before. Uh, policy management, um, something about policy management is, you know, if I've got an environment who has rights to do things in that environment versus other environments, if I, if I want not like an application development lifecycle process, I might have some entitlements which are to use the dev environment, whereas other people can promote code to the QA environment, that kind of thing. CMDB, you're inside an enterprise now, you've got to record the VM based on the VM name. That doesn't tell you very much. You've got to record what the workload is in that VM. That's part of, part of what has to be integrated there. User management, as we said before. Uh, service changes, you know, changing the entitlement around that service, you know, or you know, like I need more VMs, how do I manage that? These are just the same as before. What am I using? When am I using it? Audit, as before and quota management and service cancellation, a project comes to an end, they might not need the resources anymore, it'd be nice if they freed them up so I could you know, reuse them. 
support just as before, but obviously you're going to have to integrate in this case with a probably when you when you build a cloud for an enterprise, they're going to have an existing support system. So rather than roll your own or you know, use your own point of view, you can integrate with what they already have. Uh, cost center chargeback. Um, just a charge back. Um, one of the people have actually used that you've got to you know, do your internal billing, integrate with whatever system a customer has for internal billing. And once again, financial reporting around the use of the cloud. Okay. Just a couple of pointers um, from what I've learned at Dell on user experience, uh, user experience around using the cloud. Uh, what you do with Horizon is great at a low level. You know, you create VMs, you create networks, you you can deploy images, that kind of thing, but it's kind of it's kind of pretty pretty hands-on, pretty step intensive, that kind of thing. What we like to do around common tasks, etc., is basically provide you know a composite API effectively, which actually rolls up and means that you know from the client side you're not having to go through a lot of steps, a lot of chatty steps, a lot of slow things to actually build up a service. So you know when you're providing you know UIs and extensions as a provider. You want to basically, you know, make make long running and complicated tasks easy by providing composite services to provide those. And another tip that we learned at Dell is a lot of our customers are very, very afraid of running up a big bill. So when you're on a pay-as-you-go model inside your cloud, that kind of thing, what you want to do is um, really, um, you know, roll up uh, and pull cost into every bit of consumption. So if I create a VM rather than just create a VM, I want to see that. You know, if I'm, if I'm a consumer of public cloud, this VM is going to cost me X amount, amount per billing period and see it right then in my face, you know. Big criticism of Amazon is you kind of don't know what you're spending until you've spent it. It's very, very difficult to actually see what things are going to cost. So as a usability type tip, it's really good to be able to pull that in around, um, you know, around the consumption UI. And that's basically all I wanted to talk about. One thing that's just very, very interesting to me and it's hopefully interesting to everyone in this room uh, in terms of standing up a service is the, the, the keystone work that's going around federation and OAuth. It's something as a service provider I really need to see so that when I stand up a cloud, either private cloud or public cloud, I can allow customers to use what they already have as their, their, their current identity providers and um, you know, create that consumption experience as being as seamless as possible, as integrated as possible with what they already have. So I'll be at those sessions uh, this week. And I've put the links out there for some of the other stuff I've shown as well. So uh, any questions or anything, happy to answer them. Joe. Yep. How does it fully between integrate with SSO? The other thing there is like between the whatever identity that you need to The question is uh, how difficult is it to integrate identity management? It depends on what identity management you really have. Um, in our experience, Keystone's not too bad, but it depends on how you manage the identities between them. Uh, with when Keystone supports federation, it'll be a lot better because then you have the concept that you set up a, basically an SDS, you know, um, you, you own the issuing party SDS and then Keystone would be a reliant party SDS and you have trust between them. If you don't, you've kind of got to go through a push mechanism uh, of pushing identity out to Keystone and then doing some sort of proxy mechanism to basically get a single sign-on through if you don't have that set up. It works, but it's just a wee bit more clunky because then you have to synchronize identities between the two. The great thing if you get through federation, which we hope to get, is I'd be able to go to Horizon and use my NT account straight in Horizon rather than um, having to you know, go through a step. What we found is where, where, where the services we're providing for don't support that level of federation, you have to go through you know, dodgy steps like writing out cookies, that kind of thing, and syncing passwords with rear end uh, back end databases. And y you can get into some edge cases there where you lose synchronization. A few considerations. Well, thanks very much. I'll um, send out links to the slide. Thanks for coming. <laughs>